Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Milton Evangelical Free Church's online service. If you've not been before, it's lovely to have you with us. If you've been regularly, it's good to see you back. Um, we're going to begin our service in, in just a moment, but uh, before we do that, we're going to pray and commit our time to the Lord. Let's pray. Loving Father, as we come to you on this uh, Sunday morning, we praise you and thank you for your grace to us through the last week. We thank you for the ways in which you have protected us and kept us. We thank you for the grace that you've shown to us. We thank you and praise you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his willingness to go to the cross and to uh, bear the punishment that our sin deserves. We praise you for that this morning. We ask that as we go through this service that we would know your presence, that we would know your power, at work in us that you would, we'd know you transforming us if there's anyone who's joining us this morning that doesn't know who the Lord Jesus is and understand what he's done for them we pray that you'd open their eyes to see the wonder and the uh, and the glory of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and so we pray that you'd be uh, present in the singing we pray that you'd help us uh, as we sing in our homes and join with the worship on here we ask Lord that you would move us in our hearts to understand what is read to apply it to our lives we pray that you'd be with Giles later as he preaches your word may that have impact upon us and we ask all this for Jesus sake amen so we're going to sing um, I will sing the wondrous story and it's going to be we're going to be led in this by uh, James Williams and his crew let's sing together I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross on Calvary. I was lost, but Jesus found me. That went astray through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. I was bruised, but Jesus healed me. Faint was I from many a fall. Sight was gone and fears possessed me, but he freed me from them all. Days of darkness still come over me, sorrow's path I often tread. But the Savior still is with me. By his hand I'm safely led. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over all my joys in him complete yes i'll sing the wondrous story of the christ to die for me sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea So it's time now for the children's talk and so it's over to you gareth good morning everyone now i know what you're thinking where's mr tumble i mean giles this morning well giles is leading the service today so he's asked me to talk to you later on giles is going to be teaching us from genesis chapter 50 and finishing the story of joseph now remember what happened to joseph he had a very tough life and lots of things went wrong for him. His brothers were jealous of him, so they threw him down a well 
and sold him to slave traders who were traveling to Egypt. So he ended up a slave in a country far from his home and without his family. Can you imagine how terrible that was? Even when things seemed to be going well for him in Egypt, when he was slave to a man named Potiphar, Potiphar's wife told lies about him and he was sent to prison for years. Nothing seemed to go right for him. But then Pharaoh had a dream. And God helped Joseph understand the dream for Pharaoh, that there were going to be seven years when nothing would grow in the land. Pharaoh was worried about this, but Joseph understood that before this time, there would be seven years of good harvest. And so Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of the land, storing up food ready for the time when the crops failed. Joseph was suddenly very important and in charge. All this happened as Joseph said it would, and in time, because Joseph had prepared well, only Egypt had enough food, and all the people from surrounding countries, including Joseph's brothers, came to Egypt to get food because they were starving. And that is how Joseph met his brothers again. Now, as you can imagine, his brothers were very worried that Joseph would want revenge for the terrible thing that they did for him. But Joseph said to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph understood that God used all bad things that happened to him for good. If Joseph hadn't been sent to Egypt, many people would have starved. So if we're Christians, then we can be sure that if something bad happens in our lives, God will use it for good, just like he did with Joseph. And as we get older, we can often think of things in our own lives which seem bad at the time, but looking back, we can see how God used these times for our good. So I'm going to give you an example from my own life. Now I've told this story in church before, but once upon a time I was a young man living in a far off land, Wales in fact, where I used to have a job where I used these. Now, can you guess what my job was? Quite sharp and pointy. I'll give you a clue. Nurse, next patient, please. This is Mrs. Paddleduck, one of my regulars. Hmm. Just as I thought, a quacked filling. I'll put it on her bill. Now, yes, I was a dentist, and I used to work in a dental practice, filling teeth and pulling teeth. Sometimes I still do this for my children with a piece of string. Anyway, one day I was playing rugby and I was running with the ball and someone tackled me and fell on my arm and there was a loud snap. Everybody heard it. I had broken my arm. I had to go to hospital. My arm was badly broken in five places and I needed a huge cast right up to my shoulder. Now, do you think you can work as a dentist with a broken arm and a big cast on your arm? No, you can't. So the people who owned the dental practice where I worked, they sacked me and I was out of a job. I thought this was terrible. I didn't have a job. I couldn't work for nearly half a year. And after this time, I decided I would leave Wales and go to work in London. And there I started working as a pathologist. And do you know what happened in London? I met Maria and then I started going to Maria's church. And that is how I became a Christian. And then I married Maria and we had our children and I really enjoyed working as a pathologist. And it was this work that brought me to Southampton, into the church in New Milton. So looking back, I think it's amazing how God worked in my life. He used something that I thought was really terrible and he used it for good. So perhaps you get a bit worried when things don't go right for you or when something upsets you things don't work out as you plan. Maybe you're worried now because you can't go to school, play with your friends, but you shouldn't worry. Remember the story of Joseph and remember God's promise in the book of Romans in the New Testament. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And that's in Romans chapter 8. And it says that God uses even the bad things for the good of the people who love him. So, shall we say a prayer and thank God for this wonderful promise? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that when things 
don't seem to be going right in our lives, when we're worried about things and things are going wrong, that we know that you will use this for our own good. Please help us trust in you through difficult times. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, children. So thank you for that, Gareth. Very helpful. Uh, we're now going to sing There Is a Hope. We're going to be led in this by Simon Rowell and his team. Um, they come from a church in Kempston. And uh, for those of you who don't know, he used to be one of my bosses when I worked for Wilson Peacock in Bedford. going to hear now from God's word and Ben is going to read that to us. Today's reading is taken from Genesis chapter 50 until the end of the chapter. Joseph threw himself on his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. So the physicians embalmed him taking a full 40 days for that was the time required for embalming and the Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. When the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, If I have found favour in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him, My father made me swear an oath, and said, I am about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go up and bury my father, then I will return. Pharaoh said, 
Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear to do. So Joseph went up to bury his father. All Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court and all the dignitaries of Egypt, besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and herds were left in Goshen. Chariots and horsemen also went up with him. It was a very large company. <clears throat> when they reached the threshing floor of Atad near the Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly, and there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. When the Canaanites who lived there saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, the Egyptians are holding a solemn ceremony of mourning. That is why the place near the Jordan is called Abel Mizraim. So Jacob's sons did as he commanded them. They carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which Abraham had bought along with the field as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite. After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt together with his brothers and all the others who had gone with him to bury his father. Joseph reassures his brothers. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong things we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you, to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid, I will provide for you and your, ch your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. The death of Joseph. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family, lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110 and after they embalmed him. He was placed in a coffin in Egypt. So reads the word of the Lord. Loving Father, as we come to you, we thank you that uh, we uh, have known your hand upon us in recent days. We know, uh, we've known and uh, rejoice in the fact that you have enabled us as a country to come out of lockdown to a certain degree. We praise you for that. We long that this uh, virus would be removed, but we just commit this to you. We thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've shown us thus far. We continue to pray that your hand would be upon uh, your people. We think particularly as churches look to start uh, meeting together again, Lord, and we know that uh, some of that issue is going to be complicated with the new guidance, so we pray for your wisdom. We ask that you would grant your hand upon all of uh, your uh, people, Lord, particularly those in leadership who have to work out um, what is appropriate and wasn't isn't appropriate under the current guidelines so father we pray that your hand would be upon all those lord that have to work that through and lord we pray that you'd help us as your people to be patient and to um, acknowledge your hand and your grace in the midst of this father we ask lord that you would um, be lord not just at work in, in kind of the practical areas of services but lord we long to see more people coming to know the lord jesus christ we long to see them understanding who he is and so we ask lord that uh, the gospel would continue to go out and continue to have impact in people's lives we long to see uh, lord that when we finally do get back to meeting together properly um, we pray that there would be opportunity for people who have come to know the lord jesus christ to declare their faith and and to go through baptism to know lord your hand upon them 
in, in the days to come. Lord, we ask for those that at this moment in time are finding life difficult, um, who are struggling with different things. We ask, Lord, that you'd help them to uh, turn their eyes upon Jesus, to know his strength and help in the midst of their difficulty. Father, we commit these things to you. We pray also that you would not only just be working in this country, but we pray for uh, countries around the world. Lord, you've seen the things that have been going on in Hong Kong in recent uh, times. Lord, we pray for that nation, uh, for, for China and for all the way that it deals with things that it doesn't like. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would have your hand upon that nation in a gracious way. We pray particularly for the Christians in that nation, that you would protect them. And Lord, that you'd help them to be influencers um, of the culture around them, that they might be able to uh, shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ into into uh, hearts, Lord, that so desperately need him. So we pray, Lord, that you would be at work in China in these days. We ask, Lord, that you too would be working in the details of sorting out the uh, departing from um, Europe, Lord. We've I prayed about Brexit a lot in the past and in, in many of the recent events uh, we have uh, that's gone on the back burner but Lord time is ticking away and Lord a deal me needs to be made so we just commit that to you we ask Lord for those that are involved in negotiating that that they would do a good job Lord and that we would know your hand upon us as a nation in that way uh, Father we continue to ask Lord that you would work uh, mightily around this globe bringing men and women and boys and girls to know yourself we pray for those lord who at this moment are ill we ask that you would grant them your strength and help lord we think of particularly members of this church in in new milton we pray for uh, sue and ask lord for her ongoing care with her chemotherapy and uh, and all that needs to be done there so we just pray and commit that to you we pray for elizabeth we ask lord that you would have your hand on elizabeth that you would work powerfully in her life too uh, that you'd be with Patrick and give him all the strength that he needs in days to come. We pray for others, Lord, who uh, are, have been struggling. Um, we think of Anthony, Lord, we commit him to you and ask, Lord, that you'd give him strength too, that he might know the blessing of, of uh, you working in his life and in his family's life too. So, Lord, we commit these to you, Lord. I pray that you would be merciful to us and that you'd speak powerfully through your word now. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing again now. We're going to sing um, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say and we're going to be led in this again by Simon Rowell and his team. Stop. 
last time, Simeon posed us with the question, are you ready? Meaning, are you ready to face a holy God in death? The previous chapter ended in death, in Jacob's death, or Israel, as he was renamed by God as a covenant name. From his deathbed, Jacob urged his sons to see to it that he was buried back in Canaan in the promised land. An indication of his own faith in God. He was ready. Today I want to pose you with a new question. What is your comfort? What is your comfort in death, but also for daily living daily life. And I want to suggest that if you cherish biblical truth, you have a comfort both for life and for death. You see, the beliefs that we have about uh, God, his character, his faithfulness, his sovereignty and his actions all uh, become our comfort, both in death and also in life. First this morning, I want us to focus on comfort in a covenant keeping God in verses 1 to 14. And the end of the last chapter, Jacob breathed his last and was gathered to his people, it says. But that, of course, is a euphemism for death, isn't it? But we'll see later that it's one that truly reflects comfort in a covenant keeping God. Here in our passage, we see Joseph throws himself on his father's face, weeping bitter tears of grief, mourning loudly, this time really for the second time of losing his father, this time to death. But perhaps there's something of a cultural gap that we need to bridge here. Wouldn't we think it rather odd if we saw this behaviour today? Someone literally bodily throwing themselves onto a corpse and crying very loudly, saturating the face of this body with their tears. Our culture today might say, well, for at least everyone else's sake, put on a brave face. Some more insensitively might say, it's time to move on now. Just get on with it, as it were. But are we really stronger or wiser than Joseph? Well, no, we're not. Joseph's grieving was very understandable and grieving is right, and fitting and, and normal. But Joseph had comfort. Joseph had comfort and he stood on the fact that he knew God's promises. That which we read in Genesis 3, God said that death would one day be overcome. And he knew God's covenant made with his great grandfather, Abraham, as well. From these, he drew his comfort. Comfort even in the awful loss of his beloved father. Now we have the benefit of the full canon of God's revealed word to us, the scriptures, including the New Testament. And so for us in the face of death, we're able to say, well, Christ will come again. The dead will be raised imperishable. There will be a new creation in which there is to be no more death or mourning or crying. We read in Revelation, don't we? But I don't want to pose a question, doesn't grief seem to be at odds with hope? Grief on the one hand is represented by tears, mourning, sorrow, loss. On the other hand, hope is with great delight. It's a joyous expectation. So how do we reconcile this without rebuking someone who is crying in sorrow at the loss of a loved one as a Christian? Well, I think the answer is found in the New Testament as we consider the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, remember, he wept at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus. Why did Jesus weep? He wept because death isn't natural. Now, a scientist would obviously rebuke me and say, absolute laughable nonsense, Giles. Death is entirely natural. Everything lives and dies. But it isn't, biblically speaking. In the beginning, God created everything and there was no death. Death is our sad separation, isn't it? But death is also the reminder of God's curse upon sin. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says the wages of sin is death. Now, Jesus knew full well that he would raise Lazarus back to life. Yet he wept. He wept because of what it represented. So both Joseph and Jesus remind us that it's right and fitting 
for us to grieve with tears. But comfort is found in a covenant keeping God, faith in a covenant keeping God. I want us to consider uh, the location of Jacob's burial. They returned to Canaan. This reflected their faith in God's covenant. The field of Mechpelah was the very land that Abraham had purchased in the promised land of God in which uh, he buried Sarah, his wife, uh, where uh, he himself was buried and Isaac, his son, with Rebekah. By entering there, the brothers together declare their faith in God's covenant regarding the promised land. But his request was potentially an absolute affront to the Pharaoh and to Egypt's glory. Imagine for a moment a, a, a prime minister writes in their last will and testament that after many years of service, uh, they expect the full state funeral with all its pomp and tradition and ceremony, the streets lined with the procession and military bands at huge public expense. But imagine they reject St Paul's Cathedral. They reject the Union flag. They reject everything of British renown, ask that it's funded in a different land with a different flag. Joseph shrewdly made his request via Pharaoh's courtiers. If I have found favour in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Well, of course, he knew full well that he had earned the favour of Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh said, go. But he didn't just say go to Joseph. He sent him with a massive entourage comprising officials, dignitaries, servants, and the military, a full state funeral to accompany him and his family back to Canaan. Why? Well, to honour the father of the man whose wisdom from God saved Egypt from starving to death. The journey and its entourage are prophetic, though. They're prophetic because they would be the later uh, exodus into Egypt, uh, from Egypt, sorry, into the promised land. Reaching the threshing floor of Atad indicates that they took exactly the same longer route that the Hebrews would later take uh, several generations later in the exodus. This time, uh, the Egyptian military escorted them for their safety. Next time they would be coming in pursuit of the Hebrews with murderous intent. Joseph's heart calming, death transcending comfort was in his covenant keeping God. So I want to ask, what is your comfort? For the atheist, comfort says, well, death is just natural part of existence. In reality, they suppress the truth of God and assert their own self-righteousness on the sure road to judgment and condemnation because one day that bravado ends. Reincarnation says, well, death is a mere transition from one phase of existence here to another there. But that's not true. Hebrews 9.27 plainly says man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. What of the God-hating celebrity where uh, people pour out their affection rightly, but say rest in peace? Well, biblically, Christians can't with a clear conscience say that to someone who persistently has always rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says plainly that those who die without faith in Christ will go to a place of eternal conscious torment, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so, if you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus for salvation, may I urge you to do so today. What of the agnostic? Not hostile to God, but not yet a Christian. They use euphemisms to describe death. He, he's gone to a better place. Gone to be with the angels. Well, to you, I say, you know, the Bible uses euphemisms to describe death as well. Jacob, after all, in the previous chapter, we're told was gathered to his people, a euphemism for death. But it reflected comfort, comfort in his faith in a covenant keeping God. And for us, 
New Testament believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the new covenant in his blood. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 calls death an enemy. And an enemy it is. But it says death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us victory over death. So Joseph grieved long and loud, but his death transcending comfort was in God's covenant being kept. And for us, our comfort is greater still. Why? Well, because the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul describes that as the proof for our own resurrection. Because Christ died and rose from the dead, our faith, he said, is not in vain. He says that if there is no resurrection, our, vain, our uh, faith is futile. And another euphemism for death is used. And it reflects hope again. And it's seen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope and no comfort. You see, death is indeed an enemy, but we know that death has been defeated as Genesis 3 said it would be. And the Lord Jesus declared it was defeated. We grieve now, though we suffer with death but not as those without hope. Our comfort, our hope, is in the covenant keeping God of the resurrection. Our second focus is comfort in the sovereignty of God in verses 15 to 21. Now the family have returned back to Egypt, they honoured Jacob's wishes, and the scene turns from their mourning of the funeral to fear in verse 15. The brothers say, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong things we did to him? The voice of a guilty conscience. Now they are personally responsible for all his hardships, but why the fear? Well, one crucial difference, their father is now dead. Imagine this extended conversation between the brothers. One says, I wish dad was still here. Another one says, yeah, I, I miss dad too. And another says, no, no, you don't get what he's saying. Now dad's gone, there's absolutely nothing to stop Joseph from doing whatever he pleases with us in vengeance for those things we did to him. Fear built on a guilty conscience. Today I want to say beware a guilty conscience. Psalm 38 describes guilt as a burden too heavy to bear. Why? Well because guilt needs no accuser, does it? Guilt does its own accusing and it can distort realities and we can assume the worst in other people and situations when we're preoccupied in guilt. The brothers, their burden of guilt assumes their own evil standards it will be applied by their brother Joseph in his position of privilege as the prime minister to wreak revenge against them. And yet it's 40 years since they did these things to Joseph. 40 years of undealt with guilt they're carrying. And Joseph had forgiven them, hadn't he? Five chapters ago, in fact. Fear motivates a fabrication in verse 16. The father's alleged last instructions to give to Joseph. Forgive your brothers the sins and wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. They appeal, please, Joseph, for dad's sake, honour his dying wish. Now, of course, he may actually have said these words, but I don't think he did. Firstly, because there's absolutely no other record of it in scripture beyond this. And second, in the previous chapter, we know that at Jacob's deathbed, all 12 sons were gathered around him there. He spoke to them at length on lots of things. So surely if Jacob had really said these things, then that would have been the occasion to say them or at least allude to them. Now, if I'm right, they used their father's death 
to save their own bacon. That's a fairly despicable deed, isn't it? And yet Joseph had lavished on them mercy and allocated the land at Goshen to provide for their needs and given them protection. And yet they haven't changed. They're paranoid and in their opportunistic way they lie to save themselves. So here's the difference between Joseph and the brothers. Comfort in God's sovereignty. Journey with me back briefly to uh, chapter 45. That's the point when Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers. You might want to consider that uh, the brothers kind of uh oh moment. Uh, they might have broken out into song, you know, uh, there may be trouble ahead. But anyway, uh, they were dumbstruck on that occasion, weren't they? Joseph says, Come closer. I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. But notice that what they say afterwards includes these two crucial words. Don't be distressed or angry with yourselves. There's this great famine. But God sent me to preserve a remnant and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. Do you hear those two words? But God. The sovereignty of God was Joseph's comfort in all of his afflictions. And here, 40 years later, the brothers are still carrying this weight of guilt and they have no comfort. In self-preservation, they invent a lie. In desperation, they offer themselves groveling as slaves and in fear they fully expect his vengeance. What do they see? They see Joseph weeping. Why is he weeping? For himself, for his hardships? No. He weeps to see their torment in their guilt. Uh, he, he weeps to see the guilt that's motivated them to lie and to do his pathetic groveling. And Joseph had forgiven them long ago. And yet they still are carrying the burden of guilt. And so back in our passage in verse 19, he says these words to offer them comfort in God's sovereignty. Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them or he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So how does love, kindness, compassion and forgiveness come from the heart of someone who's been so badly wronged as Joseph? Perhaps you've been hurt, mistreated in some way in your lives and that's a difficult thing to bear. Well, the answer here is comforting God's sovereignty in those words, but God. But also Joseph uses this rhetorical question to point to him. He says, am I in the place of God? Of course he's not, is he? He's prime minister. He's in an awesome position, but he's not God. He's not God of their judgment and final condemnation. Only God is. Now, Paul in the New Testament quotes from Isaiah, the prophet in Romans, he says, who has known the mind of the Lord or uh, who has been his counsellor? Another rhetorical question about God. But if we're honest, haven't we all done that? Haven't we uh, subtly, maybe not overtly in our prayers said, this is what you need to do for me, God. Or maybe we've resented some unanswered prayers, if only, if only. Or perhaps, like the brothers, in a situation that seems to be out of your control, you kind of take the initiative, but in so doing, you push God off his throne. Joseph's comfort is in God's sovereignty, but God. Providence. Providence, whatever people's intentions, whether good or bad, God will bring about his own ultimate end. So Joseph knows that he must protect his brothers. Why? Well, because God made a covenant with his great grandfather Abraham in which he said, I'm going to make you a great nation and a blessing to all people on earth. To do that, 
He would preserve these brothers' life through the mercy and grace of their brother Joseph. And they would become the 12 tribes of Israel. Over the next 400 years, they would go from a 70-person family to a nation of 2 to 3 million Hebrews. And that nation would eventually bring the Messiah, the saviour of the world, the Lord Jesus. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle piece. You, you find it whilst you're cleaning and you put it to one side to put it back in its box. Now, why do you do that? It's only a piece of cardboard. Well, you know that it forms a bigger picture, don't you? Joseph is a bit like that. He's got a limited view, but he knows that it forms a bigger picture in God's sovereign will. And he trusts in God's sovereignty for his comfort. Joseph's words in this verse can be considered the Old Testament prequel to the New Testament words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 8 to 28. I'm sure we're very familiar with those. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, uh, who are called according to his purpose. Now, interestingly, the word that's uh, translated in our Bibles here is the one from which we get the English word synergy. Synergy means, it means the working together of two or more things to produce a, a greater result than the sum. So here's a chemistry lesson for you. Pure sodium can be harmful. Uh, pure chlorine, if you sniff it, could be fatal. But mix sodium and chlorine in the right combination and you have sodium chloride or table salt. Useful, tasty. You see, God is able to use all the toxic experiences of our life to bring about his own divine synergy. Now consider Joseph once again. Joseph was sold into slavery, but if he wasn't sold into slavery, he wouldn't have become Potiphar's servant. If he wasn't Potiphar's servant, Potiphar's wife wouldn't have accused him of uh, something to end up in prison. If he wasn't in that prison, then he wouldn't have interpreted the dreams of the cupbearer and baker. But if he hadn't interpreted their dreams, he wouldn't have been recommended to Pharaoh as a dream interpreter. And if he hadn't interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams, then he wouldn't have been made prime minister to make provision for the seven year famine. And if he hadn't made provision for the seven year famine, then his entire family would be dead in Canaan. And if they were all dead, then the Messiah couldn't have come from the tribe of Judah. And if Messiah hadn't come, the Lord Jesus, then we're all dead in trespasses and sins and without hope. See, comfort is found in the sovereignty of God, even in our hardships. Do you know that comfort of God's sovereignty? Do you believe that God can take all the bitter experiences of your life, the past or present, and Weave them together in a divine synergy for your good and for the good of others. Can you say in your hardships along with Joseph, but God? Here's the ultimate comfort in God's sovereignty. The Lord Jesus suffered. He was betrayed by Judas. But if he wasn't betrayed by Judas, then he wouldn't have been crucified. And if he wasn't crucified, then there would be a no atonement for our sins. And with no atonement for our sins, then there is no hope of heaven for us. Just a few words on the final verses of our passage today. Comfort in going home. Now, Joseph remained in Egypt another 50 or so years. He was blessed with a grand old age and saw three more generations of his family to bounce on his knee. Then he announces his imminent death, aged 110. Now, you'll be familiar with the saying, home is where the heart is, won't you? Now, Joseph knew where home really was for him. And in spite of many years there in Egypt, with all his privileges and achievements and respect and renown, Egypt wasn't his home. So he made the Israelites swear an oath to carry his bones from there one day. Why? Well, because he knew that the Israelites would one day go back home. Not for a long time yet, but they would go home to the promised land and he willed to go with them as well. Why? Well, because God's promise uh, to his great grandfather, Abraham, in Genesis uh, chapter 15. 
Notice the first three words he says there. God speaking, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and they will be enslaved and ill-treated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. In the fourth generation your descendants will come back here. Isaac knew that, Jacob knew that, Joseph knew that too. They all held on to God's promise there. But Joseph was put in a box, wasn't he, and kept there in Egypt until later. Why? Well, it was in order to be a testimony to the children of Israel, which they needed. They needed that testimony whilst they were being afflicted by the Egyptians as their slaves. That testimony was there every day to remind them of the promise their fathers had made to Joseph. To bring Joseph's bones out of Egypt into the promised land of Israel, a powerful one, and it worked. You know how in at November the 11th, at 11 o'clock, Armistice Sunday, we gather together, lest we forget. And 40 years or so ago, it was quite easy to source a few first-hand eyewitnesses to what they experience in the world wars. But each year passes, they become fewer and fewer as veterans die. And yet we remember, don't we? Why? Because we have that visual reminder of a, a poppy on our lapel or a gathering around the cenotaphs. Now imagine the challenge that they had of transmitting the promise of God's word from one generation to another and to another and to another until the Exodus, until Moses, until the children of Israel are led out. So they had, as their reminder, Joseph's bones in a box. By this, they all knew God's promise and that was their visual testimony not to forget. Joseph's dying wish and the Israelites' oath was in fact later honoured. He was indeed carried out of Egypt in the Exodus. Now for us as New Testament believers, we don't have a box of bones as a testimony, do we? We have quite the opposite. We have no bones. We have an empty tomb. That's our promise. That is our testimony to every one of us who live by faith in Christ, that this world is not our home. The writer to the Hebrews commends Joseph's final instructions to move his bones, calling that his act of faith. But that uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews helpfully bridges a gap for us between the Israelites' faith and the faith of all men and women uh, today. He says, all these people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things that were promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. 1 Peter uh, the Apostle opens by addressing his readers as God's elect exiles. That word Alexa, e e exiles can also be translated uh, strangers or foreigners, pilgrims, aliens, sojourners. He, back to Hebrews 11, it continues by saying they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. You see how it helpfully bridges the gap between their faith and the faith of uh, New Testament believers today. So I ask the question of you, where do you consider your home? This broken world? Or do you consider yourself in this world an exile, a foreigner, a stranger, looking forward to your heavenly home? See, Genesis began with perfection in the garden and it ends with death in a coffin. But that isn't the end of the Bible, is it? It's the end of the beginning book. The Bible ends with the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, not a coffin in this world. There's a, a heavenly city and that is the Christian's hope, a heavenly home that we receive by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ.
And we ought to long for that city in this world, in this life. I love uh, how great thou art, how great thou art, the hymn. Uh, that verse that says, when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. You see, the more our hearts are in heaven rather than on earth, the more we will long for that place to be with him. Paul writes in Philippians chapter one, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, he continues. So God's word of reassurance to every man and woman of faith is always, I will be with you. He was with every person of faith in Genesis and he's with you and me, a people of faith now today. But God fulfills his words, he's, he fulfills his promises and he will fulfill his promise to you. He will be with you in your walk of faith in this life until he calls you home, until uh, your comfort is in your heavenly home. If, like the Apostle Paul, your hope is to be with Christ, which is better by far. Amen. So thank you for that message, Giles. We are going to now sing. We're going to remind ourselves um, that we need to trust God as we sing I will wait for you and this is we're going to be led in this by the fiddlers and the whites um, so over to you
thank you, Lord, that your word speaks to us. Thank you that uh, we have heard that message this morning and we pray that you'd apply it to our lives. We pray that as we go from here that we would tr trust you, that we would find our comfort in you and that we would know your help uh, as we look forward to the uh, eternity that you have prepared for us. So help us, we pray, for this. Um, we ask, Lord, that you would keep us now and, uh, Lord, that you would guide us through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you for being with us. Uh, we rejoice that you are with us and we rejoice that the Lord is at work in our lives today. And so as you go on your way, I trust that you know the Lord's blessing. If you want to know any more, you'd like to speak to me, do please email me, uh, pastor underscore sim at nmefc.com and uh, or contact me through the comments below.